If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn to Luke chapter 15. And I think maybe in thinking about the good Sunday school lesson, Brother Double Ball, maybe that song might be, he asked how could we live a godly life in an ungodly world. I think maybe that song might hold some of the answer to that. If you fall in love with Jesus, friend, you fall out of love with this old world. That's right. And the more you love Him, the more you're drawn to Him, and the more He's drawn to you. And I tell you, it doesn't even seem to be a struggle. I, I'm, not, I'm not perplexed by alcohol today. I'm drinking all the beer I want to drink. Then I'm not drinking any, just for the record. Amen. I'm smoking all the cigarettes and all the dope I want to smoke, and I ain't smoking any. You know, it's, it's just a matter. Your, your love gets set upon a... Your affections on things above, and it, it just seems like it takes it off. The pull of this old world, there's nothing out. The bar room doesn't appeal to me. The pool tables don't appeal to me anymore. Dens of gambling don't appeal to me anymore. So what happened to you? Did you go crazy? No, I got my right mind. I was crazy before. If you don't believe it, just ask some of the people that knew me before. I was crazy. Sin is a form of insanity, I believe, with all my heart. It's a form of insanity. But oh, when Jesus comes in, He gives you your right mind, puts you in your right mind, gives you the right way to walk, gives you something to live for and something to die with. Aren't you glad this morning for what old time salvation will do for you? Well, let's not be so quiet about it, huh? Right. Amen. Dear Brother Connie Martin at the little church at O'Toole where we started out, thank God He put some saints in my life early on that influenced me. Brother Connie was one of those fellows like Brother Double that had experienced the fire and the glory back there in Indiana with the Nazarene church was ablaze with the glory of God. I tell you, Brother Connie was a shouter. He was uh, one of the shortest fuse people I'd ever met. And it wasn't a temper fuse. It was a blessing fuse. You just mention the name of Jesus sometimes and he'd get shouting happy. He worked as a used car salesman in a Buick dealership in Welch, West Virginia. I hesitated to visit him at work because I knew if we got to talking about the Lord, Brother Connie was going to get blessed right there in the middle of that Buick dealership, and he did time and time again. And when he got blessed, he wasn't quiet about it. He didn't stifle it. All that glass and tile in that big showroom and all those shiny metal automobiles, Brother Connie's voice, praise God, glory to God, hallelujah. I mean, he got wound up right in the middle of a Buick showroom. Can you imagine such a thing? He said, well, he probably got fired. No, he didn't because Luke Jeanette, the millionaire that owned that Buick dealership, realized that Connie Martin was praying for him. Connie would go and put his arm around that millionaire and said, Luke, I'm praying for you, buddy. I love you. Jesus loves you and wants to save you. When his millionaire buddies would come around, Brother Connie would go up to him with tears in his eyes and I'm praying for you, fellas. So he let him shout in his showroom. I tell you, the love of God, Spirit of God in our hearts. Thank the Lord. But anyway, when the church got quiet, he come up with the idea, you know, these fans they used to give out with the sticks on them, funeral home fans, you know. Well, Brother Connie come up with the idea of, of making him some fans with those little cards on them. And he said, put, he put hallelujah on one. He put amen on another one. He put glory to God on another one. And when he thought it was time for the congregation to be trained, it, he'd hold up whichever sign he thought was appropriate. Well, he trained us to just be vocal about this thing. We've lost some things in our movement, folks. We used to be noisy rings. That's what the Nazarenes were criticized and ridiculed because they were shouting people. They were, they, were, they were vocal. They were demonstrative. And it's not all in demonstration this morning, but I believe there's something to be said for a hearty amen. Yes, right. Old Brother Atwell Sr. said, if you swallow your amens, you'll get spiritual upset stomach. <laughs> So you need, to, you need to, if it's truth, amen the truth. That'll help the preacher. And it'll keep you freed up a little bit. You won't be so bound down. Well, that's not in my message this morning, but that's free. Thank you for coming this morning. Thank the Lord for letting us awake to a beautiful Sabbath day. The air was so fresh out on the hillsides of Pomeroy this morning. 
So I stepped outside in just a fresh morning. Beautiful morning. God is so good to us. Do you rejoice in every day that He lets you live? If you've had a near-death experience, you will. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's good to be alive. Luke chapter 15. I'd like to talk to you about these three parables as quickly as I possibly can. But uh, I'd like to focus, obviously, on the third parable in this chapter, which is the parable of the lost sons. You get that? You called it, didn't you? Luke chapter 15, verse 1, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners to hear him. Isn't that wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if they drew near to hear the word of God today? The Pharisees and the scribes, though, murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And of Jesus, in answer to this murmuring, in answer to this mindset that accused him of doing something wrong because he was trying to care for and minister to the lost, huh? That's what prompted these parables. Let's look at them. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? When he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Jesus is trying to help these Pharisees to see, you know, they, they were majoring on their righteousness and gloating over their righteousness and gloating over their spirituality to the point that they were looking down on the poor sinner and not showing adequate love and compassion. God save us from that. God save us from that attitude. And this is exactly what Jesus is addressing in these three parables. He tells you, if a man lost a sheep and it was straight away, you know, it just kind of kept grazing and kept grazing. And sheep are not known to pay attention to their surroundings. And it just kept grazing and sooner or later it grazed off all by itself. It had separated itself from the flock. It was lost. It may have been caught in a, in a bramble bush somewhere. But when that shepherd counted his sheep and realized that one of them had strayed off, friend, the good shepherd went and left the ninety and nine. Aren't you glad that I'm the sheep or the lamb that the shepherd left the flock for? Yes. Aren't you glad he took a, a, a little bit of a break from the church family? Now, not really. God doesn't have to take a break from anybody, does He? But He did take notice that there was a sheep out there on the backside of nowhere that had gone astray. And he left the 99 figuratively and went out into the wilderness and found that sheep that had gone astray. And he said, friend, there's rejoicing in heaven over every stray that gets brought back to the fold. Are you looking for the strays this morning? That's right. Jesus' parable here. Said I say likewise. Well, as I read verse 7. Verse 8. Either, this is parable number 2. What woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of, angel, of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Jesus is driving home a point here. You know, a piece of silver is worth looking for, I imagine. It's worth being diligent to search the house to try to find something of value that you've lost. But friend, what is a piece of silver in comparison to the value of a soul? 
I beg of you to consider this morning. What is it that you've lost? We've all lost things across the years. And the older we get, the more we lose. <laughs> the more we forget where we laid it. Say, so where was it at? Right where I left it. Usually that's where it's at. But friend, Jesus is making a very strong and stringent point to these Pharisees today. He said that coin was valuable to that woman. These sinners aren't valuable to you. But they were valuable to Him. Aren't you glad? Yes. Amen. Sinners received Him gladly. And He did not entertain their wickedness. He did not engage in their wickedness. He did not enable them to continue in their wickedness. Jesus simply ministered the truth to them. And gave them the hope of eternal life. That's why they loved Him, friend. He gave them the truth. And His Word was one of authority. Not as the scribes and the Pharisees who were so hypocritical about their religion. But Jesus was authentic. And when He told them He loved them, when He told them He was going to provide them eternal life, they could believe Him. They could trust Him. God help us today as a church yes. to love them until they trust us. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. Then thirdly, this great beloved parable this morning, which is uh, in most Bibles, it's been labeled the parable of the prodigal son. But as a Bible student myself, while that part of the parable is beautiful and it's more used than the other part of the parable, but it really probably should have been labeled according to the context, the parable of the elder brother. He said, I don't agree with that. Well, you're, you're entitled to be wrong all you want to. No, I'm kidding. Everyone's entitled to their opinion on some things until the Word of God makes the truth plain and then our opinions don't really matter too much. But as we read this parable, I want to speak to the elder brother a little bit, but then I also want to touch on the prodigal son this morning. A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them, them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, got his inheritance, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He sent him into the fields to feed the swine or the hogs. What more degrading position could you give a Jewish boy than feeding the hogs? Hogs to them were the most unclean animal probably that walked. Kind of smelly too. And not only did he have the responsibility of feeding the hogs, but he also had the necessity of feeding himself said he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, sent him into the fields to feed the swine, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, I like that, don't you? I wish some folks would come to themselves. Just see what a mess sin has made in their lives. He began to see in his life, and I, I can't get here, i got to go to the last part first. I can't get started preaching on the prodigal son yet. He came to himself and said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose came to his father, and when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. 
But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. Now the elder son was in the field. All this was taking place. And he came and drew nigh to the house and heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Verse 28, And he was angry. He was mad because his brother had come back home. Well, maybe not so much that he'd come back home, but he'd received such a welcome. How do you feel when someone comes in that's lived a very unworthy life? How do we feel this morning when somebody comes in that's had chance after chance, maybe grew up in a Christian home, and they have gone out and made a mess of things, and you just say, ah, they deserve everything they got. Is that the church's attitude? That was the Pharisees' attitude. They had come to despise the sinners. Thought they were too good to interact with them. He was angry and would not go in. He was pouty. Therefore came his father out and entreated him just like he would the other son. He's come to entreat the elder son. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Do you ever feel like doing this to him, the little violin? The little pity party he's having right now? But as soon as thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Friend, the church of Jesus Christ needs to get excited again about sinners coming to God. Seeing someone pray through. Leading someone to Christ. Bringing them in. Doesn't matter how far they've gone. Doesn't matter how dirty they are. Doesn't matter how many tattoos they have. I tell you, I'm not given to tattoos. I don't, I don't have any need for them. And I don't believe a Christian has any place for them. I tell you, but I tell you, there's a whole host of the world out there that's plastered all over with them. And if we turn our backs on them, friend, they'll never have the love of God shown to them. Amen, preacher. I'm not into green hair or fluorescent orange hair or any other dye-colored hair. I believe y'all just wear it however God gave it to you. And if it changes color after a few years, so be it. If it turns white, so be it. If it turns loose, so be it. (laughs) Brother Brad said, Amen. (laughs) Amen. Amen. I'm not into what they're into. I'm not into what these goths are into. I'm not into dressing in solid black with chains all over me. I'm not into devil worship. I'm not into homosexuality. I'm not into these perverted lifestyles. But friend, they're sinners. And we dare not pick and choose who we're willing to share the Gospel with. Amen. This elder brother was the typical Pharisee. He didn't want anything to do with his own brother. His brother had done wrong. There's no question the brother was foolish in all that he did. He was so unwise to do what he did and to walk away from what he walked away from. But thanks be unto God, he had enough sense to come to himself and make his way back. How many go out from the family of God? How many leave the churches across America and backslide and go out into deep sin and never, ever, ever come back? And some people never even get invited back. 
I really believe that the main emphasis that Jesus was making that day was to this guy. Can you see that? Can you see that this is the attitude that the people had in verse 2? This is the very attitude Jesus was talking about. And this is the thing He's refuting. But in the midst of refuting these Pharisees, He's given us one of the most beautiful invitations to the sinner and the backslider that's ever been written. This is a beautiful story. It's not beautiful because the young boy wanted out from under his father's dominion. It's not wonderful when young people feel like they've just got to get out from under mom and dad. It's a sad day, friend, when we jump out of the frying pan right smack dab into the fire. Now, I've had a lot of years of pastoring to watch this thing come to pass. I've seen a lot of young people get rebellious and determine they're going to break away from the restraints of going to church and living a certain way and being commanded to do certain things. Friend, I want to tell you, someone's going to be your boss out there You can get out from under your parents at one point, but friend, you're going to come under a boss. You're going to come under civil authority. If you join the army, you're going to come under your DI. And he's going to tell you what to do. Amen? He's going to make it rough on you for a while because he needs to make sure you're going to obey orders. We're going to be under someone. I could give you names. I could tell you stories the rest of my allotted time this morning of teenagers and young people that were chomping at the bits to get out from under the restraints of a Christian home and then plunged right headlong into a far worse situation. I know families and parents' hearts that are bleeding this morning because their daughter couldn't wait till she got to the age where the law says she could decide where she was going to live. Now that varies from state to state. In South Carolina, it was 17. The day of her 17th birthday, her boyfriend came to pick her up. It wasn't a few weeks or months until she was expecting a baby out of wedlock. It wasn't just a few weeks or months until he dropped her off on a, on a, a stretch of highway, kicked her out of the car to walk back into town in a dark night on a deserted stretch of highway. And friend, I want to tell you, You don't realize how good you've got it, young people. If you've got parents that love you enough to want to teach you the right way, you don't realize how good you've got it. But the world is a big wide eye opener. It's a big eye opener. You become an adult real quick when you realize now you've got to work for a living instead of coming and eating at dad's table all the time. Instead of having everything handed to you and given to you, almost on a silver platter today in many cases. You realize you've got to scrape and scratch and beg and work and, and do whatever you've got to do to make ends meet to try to keep an old junker car together? Huh? Yes, sir. Life out there is a real eye-opener. Right. And thank God it was for this young man. Thank God he remembered I was never hungry back home. I was never without food or clothes. My dad was a great provider. And our Heavenly Father is a great provider this morning. Amen. And this boy realized that in the Father's house, there was plenty to eat. He didn't have to eat hog food. He didn't have to be in this hog pen. Oh, to God that some people would wake up and realize what a mess their life is really in. You can show them pictures of people on meth with their teeth rottening out and their body turning into skin and bones. And they look at that person as a poor person while all the time they never think about giving up the meth themselves. Friend, the devil's blinded the minds of so many people in our culture. It is sad, sad indeed. But every time a poor sinner boy or girl gets their right eyes, gets their mind opened up and their eyes opened up, gets their ears unstopped to where they can hear the voice of God again, would it be something if people in this community could hear God's voice calling them? They have ears, the Bible says, but they hear not. They have eyes, but they see not. 
They have hearts, but they understand not. Because God has put this blindness for because of rebellion, because of our sin of disobeying and rejecting Christ, America is coming under a dark, dark cloud. When I landed in Haiti the first time 30 some years ago, I felt the darkness in Haiti. I felt the voodoo witchcraft. I felt the evil spirits that permeate that little island. But I want to tell you, friend, it's coming to America. There's places you will go, and I went into a hamburger joint just because the name just intrigued me. I said, what kind of place would be called Burgatory? Have you ever seen the, the hamburger joint Burgatory? And I'm thinking in my mind, is that something to do with the only other word that rhymes with that that I know about is Purgatory? So is this hamburger joint? And sure enough, when I went in there, it was everything was black. Everything was lit by red lights like flames of fire. Now, I didn't buy a hamburger in Burgatory. I will never go back in Burgatory. But it's here, friend, and Satanism is on the rise. Witchcraft is on the rise. Voodoo is on the rise in America. The prison where I had a prison ministry for about four years, one of the leading managers, a woman in that prison, she had for her license plate, voodoo. She was the one that set the chapel service. Dear Brother Seifert made the mistake of sharing with her because we went in some days after the voodoo service was over. It's a different atmosphere in that place after the voodoo crowd had been in there. Brother Seifert was sharing with her, not realizing who she was. I wanted to elbow him so bad. I, that to, to just shut up, shut up. But he was on a roll. And he was telling this lady how bad the atmosphere was when we get into the chapel after that voodoo crowd's been in there. But you know the state says you can't discriminate against any religion. They've got to let them all in there, I guess, according to their mindset. But to me, voodoo's not a religion. And it is a religion, I guess, but to me it's not a religion. But I want you to know tonight when you get your eyes open. Get your heart open. Get your ears open to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say. Friend, we need to pray that God will open some ears and eyes. They're blind. They're deaf. They can't hear. Had a demon-possessed woman came to our services at a particular camp meeting years ago. And uh, God in His infinite love and mercy began to put a desire for my wife and I to win this young woman to God not realizing at first the terrible bondage that she was in. But the devil would send people like that into the services, she said, to hinder the services and attack the preachers. And she said, I sat through service after service not hearing a word the preacher said. The devil stopped her ears to keep her from hearing the wonderful words of life. But thanks be unto God, when someone began to show an interest and began to pray, she said, Preacher, you're the first preacher I've ever heard what he said. And God helped us to pray her out of that bondage. Deliver her from the demon possession she was in. Still a Christian this morning. Thanks be unto God. I want to tell you something, friend. Their ears are stopped. Their eyes are covered. The blindness has settled in. But this old boy, he had gone out there and he'd done everything he shouldn't do and he'd done it all the wrong way. He had wasted everything he had. All of his future was shot on a little bit of sin and pleasure for a season. And now it was all over and the payday had come. But he came to himself and he said, I'm going home. Thanks be unto God. And we ought to be praying that some of these prodigals Sons and daughters, my family and your family, my kin people and your kin people, our friends and your friends, our acquaintances and your acquaintances, that somehow God would put in their heart a desire to get out of the hog pen of sin. Amen. I want you to know this morning that old boy said, I'm going home. I'm going home. He already premeditated his speech when he got home, didn't he? He is practicing what he's going to tell daddy when he got home. 
And you know what? He did it just exactly right. He took the blame. Don't come to God telling Him who all is the reason you're in the shape you're in. Come to God taking the blame. Come to God saying, Lord, I have sinned. Well, so and so did too. Lord, don't forget about that. That's not in the picture when you're coming back to God. When you're coming to God, He's dealing with you and your sin. And the old boy said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against Thee. I'm not worthy to be Your Son anymore. If You'll let me go back, come back home, I'm willing to sleep in the servants' quarters. I'm willing to serve You as a slave. Just let me come home, Father. What an attitude. What a right approach to God. Friend, we don't deserve a thing but death and hell because we've sinned against the Holy God. But in His love and mercy, He has opened up His arms of mercy. You say, what was the Father's attitude? I believe the Father was looking for Him. He said when He was yet a long ways off, the Father saw Him. When you see someone coming a long ways off, you're looking. Most of us don't see what's in front of us. The Father was looking down the lane, waiting for the day when His wayward boy would come home. That ought to be our attitude. Looking down through prayer. Oh God, I'm waiting for the day I can see my daughters come back to God. I'm waiting for the day when my grandbabies, all seven of them, come back to God. I'm looking for that friend. I'm waiting. I'm longing for the day when I see them turn the corner and head down the lane toward home. The father didn't wait till he got there and said, I told you so. Was that the father's attitude? My Bible says the father ran. <laughs> he recognized that boy. Even at a long distance, that's my boy. I'd know that walk anywhere. That's my boy. And the father began to run to meet him. And when he met him, he didn't kick him, he didn't bruise him, he didn't tell him, now I want you to know all this stuff that you've been doing. Didn't mention a thing, did he? He just fell on his neck and kissed him. Oh God, help me to love the sinner. Help you to love the sinner. Till we can look for them and long for them in the heart of God. Till we can wait and long for them in prayer. Until God can help us to pray until we see them coming down the lane. And when we do, we're not going to mention what they've done. We're not going to throw their past up to them. We're going to look at them and say, God loves you and Jesus can save you and forgive you. And when He forgives it, He removes it. As far as the east is from the west, so far will He remove our transgressions from us. That's far enough for me. They're gone. Two indefinite points headed into infinity. Those sins are sent into infinity. Now there's a North Pole and a South Pole, but there's not an East Pole and a West Pole. You head East, you can go into East, you can go East all the way till you exit the Milky Way. And I don't know what's beyond that. But you can keep going. And that's where God sent your sins. As far as the East is from the West, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us this morning. Church, God help us to have the attitude of God the Father in this parable. He fell on His neck. He restored Him. He didn't punish Him. He didn't put Him in the servants' quarters. He brought a brand new robe out. Put Him back in the family position. He said, what about that ring, preacher? You all don't believe in rings. Well, in that situation, this was the family signet. This was the thing they stamped their, their documents with. We, we pull out a credit card or write a check with our name on it. But in those days, there was a signet that signed. And the, the father's signet mean he was standing good for whatever it is the son signed. He gave him the signet of the family back. And then he went out and brought, got in the fatted calf, that calf that had been in his stall. He had been off the grass for a while. He'd been on the corn. That makes them good, you know. If you've been raised on the farm, you want to put them on corn for a while before you butcher them. Then you bring them in and that fatted calf was killed and it was barbecued just right. I mean, it was cooked to perfection. 
They had a celebration. I mean to tell you, the servants were rejoicing. The family, the rest of the family was rejoicing. While old elder brother was out there stewing, everybody else was having a good time because Johnny or Joey or whatever his name was, who was dead and lost, has come back to God and is alive again. Right. Let me just inject just a, a just short piece of doctrine here. Once a child, always a child. Once a son, always a son. You remember that doctrine? You've heard that because it's once in grace, always in grace. Did he not still come back as a son? He did. But two times in this parable, he came back as a dead son. Now you may still know that you were one time part of the family of God. But friend, you're back in the same boat you were when you met God the first time. You're dead in trespasses and sins. You'll have to be quickened again to get back into the family relationship. Get back into the family positions. Praise God this morning. Aren't you glad for the Word of God that speaks truth to us? Right. You know, I'm glad to ha- I would have been glad to have had a son. But we quit after two girls. I said, this could be a string of girls because my wife came from a family of four girls. And I said, if we keep having children, there's just going to be more girls. Now, I love girls. I didn't necessarily relish growing up in a girl's dorm. I mean, I, for 18 years, I lived in, with three women and girls, you know, and long hair everywhere, bathroom drains clogged, and had to buy all those hoes for all those women for all those years, and they could go through a bunch of them. But anyway, I didn't have a boy. But I tell you, I wouldn't want my boy to come home in a casket if I had one, would you? But they're in spiritual death when they go back out into sin. You lose that relationship with God. And you have to do your first works again. But here they are. God, the Father, as typified by the Father in this, says, my son, which was dead, is alive again. I spoke to you on backsliding earlier in the meeting. And I gave you the verse where it says God is married to the backslider. Friend, there's a covenant that God makes with each one of His children when we come to Him. And God never breaks His part of the covenant. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't brush us aside. We leave Him. But if we'd be willing this morning, if we're backslidden or if, we're, if we've played the part of the prodigal in some way, or if we've been the elder brother, I would think we would need to ask God to help us this morning to be a church like Jesus that loves the sinner, reaches out to the sinner. Shall we stand this morning?